So welcome everyone. This is uh, another program of our podcast called Globedades. And today I'm extremely pleased to have uh, Elena Panaritis. Elena Panaritis is uh, an economist and uh, she's uh, an expert in several themes. Uh, I could read her CV for the whole show, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to just introduce her and uh, telling you that she has worked for uh, such organizations as the World Bank. She was involved also in uh, trying to solve the uh, Greek economic crisis. And uh, she's well known in uh, all the uh, financial Uh, circles in uh, in several parts of the world, in Europe as well. And uh, she has also received a, a couple of uh, awards, the uh, Global Best Practice and Innovation Awards uh, given by the World Bank and the U.S. government. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you this morning with us, uh, Elena Panaritis. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure being with you. It's uh, it's really wonderful to uh, to be able to be in Mexico and to uh, have the opportunity to share some of our ideas and our uh, experiences with you and uh, your audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. And today, well, the the um, the topic that we selected for this program is to talk about formalizing the informal. Now, Elena. Uh, Why is it essential to formalize informality? Well, the first thing is to understand what is informality. So, uh, and then recognize also the impact informality has. So, um, informality is a behavior that of humans, of people, of players in the market, uh, that is also social and economic, and it tends to be outside the regulated environment of an economy. It's usually not measured. It incorporates economic activity. Um, and um, it is marginal, basically marginal behavior. I don't mean marginal behavior as criminal behavior or illicit behavior or, Ill or illegal behavior. I mean um, behavior that goes around bureaucratic and regulatory structures. Um, So an example of an informal person is somebody, and an informality is what is somebody that does not have security of their existence. So you have no security of your own existence. Uh, I have no security of my own existence. And then a community doesn't have security of their existence. But then they start... Uh, connecting all together. So because all of them don't have security, they start generating an ecosystem of lack of security. And therefore, uh, if you wish, behavior that is very um, not continuous, has little level of trust, has a uh, little level of ownership, of proof of ownership. Everybody has to prove that they exist and everybody has to prove that they own something. Uh, and... Um, that ecosystem generates all sorts of other impacts. Child labor is a serious one. One of these elements is child labor. Another one is la lack of civic engagement and civic awareness within a community. So it's very hard to establish democracy in, an esta in, a, in a space that has that type of behavior. Um, in a country or in an economy that has such behavior. We have high level of small and medium enterprises, small uh, abulantes, como dicen, no? Abulantes, um, uh, small little businesses that don't grow more than five people, which is basically family cottage businesses. And then, of course, you have this environment attracting all sorts of illicit activities. So if you don't have security, then government doesn't seem to be able to secure you because it is so complicated to engage with government and formal activities that go outside of them. Therefore, you become a, a space of a fruitful space for 
terrorist activities, for illicit activities, for trafficking. So imagine, Arturo, we have about 70% of the world's population that wow. operates in this space. Is this this seventy uh, percent is uh, like uh, on a global um, perspective, or is it more like in places like Latin America or Africa or Asia or Europe, even? Or how would you uh, divide this percentage of uh, well, seventy percent is quite a lot. Yeah, well, actually, it's more than seventy percent. It is it is growing exponentially. It is global. It has zero, um, it has no bias between colors or races or richness of countries. So you have informality in Mexico, as we all know, of course, uh -huh. in a much higher percent, as a matter of fact. But you have informality in Latin America. You have informality in the United States. You have informality in Europe. Okay. You definitely have informality in Africa and Asia. But right now, uh, Arturo, you have informality even in Germany. And this is why we should care about formalizing. This is why we should care. And I would like to make a distinction and say, I'm not interested in formalizing. I'm interested in transforming informality, in turning it around completely. Because if you transform informality, imagine this amount of people go finally into the middle class. Okay. Okay. And once you have a so more solid middle class, you reduce all the insecurity risk. Yeah, my, my next question will go precisely in that sense of, um, like, what do you think is the most significant impact of uh, formalizing informality? You, you mentioned something about uh, developing or increasing the, uh, the middle class or, or inviting these people as, you know, to, to join this group. Uh, but uh, yeah, which which will be that uh, impact or of you know formalizing the informal or transforming as you just transforming, said? Transforming, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so basically, imagine this: you reverse child labor, you reverse education. So more people, more children go to school, more children get vaccinated, more children get accept access to basic health. So this is one thing. First thing is you start having the ability of a better and, and more healthier uh, population in a country. The second thing is, and the most important part, now your economic activity has a name and a last name. Your economic activity is recognized, it's registered. So you have registered your birth and your death, so you exist. You have a registration of your title of your property. Registration, not a title, registration. Very important, very different things. Registration is formalization. So you now know without doubt that this home belongs to you, this car belongs to you, this business belongs to you, and therefore now you're an active member of an economy. So you're an active active um, player in a market and you instead of being uh, how can I say that instead of being in the in the nails of some usury lender mm -hmm. instead of being in the uh, nails of some illicit behavior and security provider that could be even a terrorist now you can access yourself security through the police the regular police through uh, a banking system that is a formal and low interest rates. You can get a loan and a mortgage. You can basically have a, a bigger freedom of deciding what to do. That bigger freedom is nothing else but the behavior of a middle class. A middle class is um, growing and becomes stronger and becomes more robust. And we have seen this in countries where I have worked and we have done the transformation. Great, great. Uh, just to remind uh, uh, that we are talking today about formalizing the informal with uh, Elena Panaritis. My name is Arturo Flores and uh, this is our program Globedades, a program uh, from the uh, Faculty of uh, Global Studies at Anahuac University.
So uh, we also read, Elena, that you developed a uh, what it's labeled or you label it as the reality check analysis. Can you tell us what this is about? So uh, as 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 you said in the beginning when you introduced me, I'm an economist. I've uh, studied economics and I actually studied and focused in the in my education. Um, more on monetary and macroeconomics, um, where everything that I'm talking, we've just discussed in formality, is not is is not existent because we assume in our economics training that things are formal, that people have contracts when they go and hire get hired in in the labor market that uh, people when they get born they get immediately registered their birth and when they die their death is registered as well uh, that um, your title of ownership is registered and therefore there is no doubt about who owns what and who is who unfortunately down the road in my experience when i was working with the world bank i realized that this is really not the case and we are working with countries assuming that they have all these institutions and all these agreements in place and there is pretty much very limited number of frictions and transaction costs but in reality there are only transaction costs which you can call them bureaucracy and only frictions and these frictions and transaction costs generate informality so I decided to figure out a way of resolving it because it was making no sense. We were working basically with countries that we would be dealing with only, let's say, 10% of the economy, 20% of the economy. Uh, and then it's very frustrating because you try to do a macroeconomic policy, but it doesn't really trickle down all the way. So I decided to identify where are the levels of friction where do we have transaction costs generated? If you only take a snapshot of an economy today in 2023, let's say, and you try in 2023 to have um, a, a, a slice of the economy, see how many people are in the informal behavioral sector, which is hard to figure out. You need to do triangulations, it's not easy. And then what are the transaction costs, in other words, the frictions, you will not receive a, bet, a, be, a, a wonderful, uh, a, a good picture. Why is that? Because the informality is like an accumulation of behavior for many, many years throughout history. So reality check analysis analyzes the reality of the country through the years down at the beginning of the creation. So since your beginning, let's say we take Mexico, since the beginning of the creation of Mexico, and actually since the colonial time before the, the, the independence, mm -hmm. you need to identify who were the, what was the legal infrastructure that was regulating economic behavior, who was um, who were the players and who had a special interest for a specific type of legal intervention every single time that there was a legal intervention. While you do that, you go all the way up to today and then you accumulate, Arturo, so many special interests, groups, that you would have never thought in 2023 they existed. In 2023, you probably think that the special interests are a few business people, some oligarchs, um, some political leaders, but that's not, it. that's not it. You have professions that have been generated. You have uh, agencies and organizations that have been created in the past as special interests themselves. And if we don't recognize that, we will not be able to do the transformation needed. So, for example, I have worked very thoroughly in the country of Peru. It's extraordinary to tell you how many layers of special interests were involved. And once you know them, then you are wiser in your definition of reform today.
because you incorporate them, right? Yes, yes, yes. I, yeah, I was just about to ask you about the case of Peru because we uh, we read what you did there and, and it's really impressive. And uh, I do not know whether you can expand a bit more because it's a very, it's a very good case uh, that shows this methodology that you were just saying, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the reality check analysis, which I think is very is very interesting, innovative in many ways, and it can work uh, as an example for other countries as well. So, could you please tell us a bit more about about the the Peruvian case? Sure. So in uh, Peru, I started working in 1991, uh, and uh, it was a country, the snapshot of of pretty much all of Latin America in 1990, right? except uh, Colombia and Chile, defaulted country. Uh, they had defaulted in their external debt, in their World Bank debt, in their IMF debt. In their, they weren't paying anything. They weren't paying anything, anything. So they, they even had, they weren't paying even their interest or their arrears. So we had a lot of, a lot of debt accumulated. The country had over 60% poverty, meaning below one and a half dollars a day, right? Extreme poverty. We had um, almost zero middle class. The majority of the people had left the country. Uh, minus 17% of GDP. Minus 17% wow. of GDP. That's impressive. That was, um, that was really obvious when you would go visit the country, right? So minus 17% and hyperinflation of over 1 million percent a year. Wow. So you were trying to buy this, this pen, mm -hmm. at 9 in the morning, and at 10 it was double the price. Yeah, of course. Okay, all right. So, so the situation was lines for all basic goods, because if you have such high inflation and such low productivity, so, I mean, it was impossible to find. The supply chain was broken. So you had no sugar and and oil for cooking and rice and the, the country of rice, right? <coughs> uh, so it was, it was malfunctioning. And um, I thought, we thought we went in and we tried to do macro adjustments, uh, trying to fix the, 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 at the time was Intis, we turned it into Soles, tried to structurally adjust the macro adjust, uh, macroeconomy, tried to fix the central bank, the basic microeconomic adjustment one does. Then I also went further down and thought, why don't we try to find out why do we have so many Pueblos Jovenes? Pueblos Jovenes were basically tuburbios or barrios oh. that are some in the, so in the perimeter of the city, but some are in the center of the city. So you would go into old haciendas or small little, small, big colonial homes, and they were like infested by 18 families living in there, occupied. So I went back to see the public registries to identify, you know, who owns what. So Arturo, in 1993, the public registry of Peru had 100,000 registered properties out of 25 million people. Wow. So, so some adjustment was required. <laughs> <laughs> A tiny bit. The, the funny thing is, I was the only one seeing this because a regular economist wouldn't even think about that. This is like they, they wouldn't think that we, we are we are taking it into we're assuming that these things are in place. Right. We assume that the judiciary works. We assume that contracts are established. We assume that everybody registers their property and we assume that the registries work. So I started to work in a space that was very much unknown for basic traditional economics and one could call it new institutional economics, call it whatever you want. The solution was that we had, I used reality check analysis, that's why I told you why we have 100,000 people registering plots and properties. 
And we found out that the reason was there was no reason to register your property because there was no market that was functioning and there was no reason for you to go get a loan or something else. Yeah. But if you wanted to inherit it, God forbid, only 100,000 could inherit, could, could sell or inherit formally. Yeah, of course. Everybody else was, 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 and then we wonder why we had Sendero Luminoso taking over the country. You, you see my point. So after this, we did a thorough an analysis of who was responsible in, in wanting to hold this. Yeah, we were really committed. We noticed that there were some benevolent interest groups and some not benevolent interest groups. Some of them were, for example, El Colegio de los Notarios. They, they, we had like only eight notary publics, so we had to increase the number of notaries. So these were small little steps but really with big friction and difficulty to change and now we created a new registry um, that is more flexible and it has it incorporates uh, the mapping which is a cadaster it incorporates the zoning what can you build it incorporates the roads it incorporates the usage uh, now over th over 30 million people are registered. And it is a country, as you know, we hear all the time about Peru right now because of the political problems. But it is a country that, although presidents fall, the economy keeps growing. We have a real 7.2% right now, GDP growth of the country. 7.2. Even with the political struggle? No, because it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter who is the president. It doesn't touch them because they own. I'll give you the following is the best example ever. When the president, the former president of Peru, just just in November, end of November, decided to do an auto golpe, mm -hmm. he called the, poli the, the military with him. The military did not support him. The military left him alone. He had to go. He, he had to call afterwards the the embassy of the Mexican uh, Republic to see if they would be willing to give him an asylum. Because he was left alone. No one wanted to be on his side. This very presumably popular president, when he needed the help to remain in power, no one was next to him. Not even his vice president, but let alone this is one person. I'm talking about institutions like the military. Mm. And do you know why this is the case, Arturo? Uh, the military went on the side of many uh, many golpes in the past, of course. But now it didn't. These people are middle class. These people live in what used to be Pueblos Jóvenes, and now they're not called Pueblos Jóvenes anymore, these barrios. They're called Cono Norte, Cono Este. They're like colonias. You okay. go there, and they have everything from a gym to a sauna to a to a Palacio de Justicia, to a, to a police uh, department, to a church, football stadium. They are like amazing centers of, of social and economic activity. Why would they want to let go of all this so that they can do another little coup? So that was to me, that is the best institutional reform one can do because you are engaging and promoting a reform based on principles and it doesn't have a first and a last name. It's not called Panaritis, it's not called Suarez, it's not called Flores, it's yeah, not called it's anything. It, yeah. it's, 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 the, it's, it's them, it's the, it's the citizens. It's the yeah. citizens, they are now stakeholders, punto. Yes, yes, it's, it's very interesting how, how uh, providing a, a property title can change someone life so so big. it's a it's a property registration because you yeah, can have a title but not a registration and yeah. i just wanted to add one more thing 60 plus percent poverty now is down to 4.4 and it goes with COVID. it went up to 20 but the 2022 was uh it's not extreme poverty it's okay. like five dollars or ten dollars, but it, amazing, amazing to see. I mean, so from sixty percent to four percent. Yeah. Extreme poverty. Extreme, extreme poverty. less than one dollar a day. Yes. Extreme poverty. Yes. Yeah. So that's. 
Now, if, if you if you if you lose your job two or three months in the row, then you go to twenty three percent because of COVID. They had people that were they were not paying able to pay their bills, but that's not less than one dollar a day. Yeah, well, uh, no, it's it's. A, I'm from Greece, Arturo. We don't have that. <laughs> yeah, we don't. Yeah, it's 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 very very impressive. Uh, just a reminder that today uh, we are uh, talking uh, with uh, Elena Panaritis and we are talking about formalizing the informal. This is Globedades, a podcast of the Faculty of Global Studies at Anahuac University. And my name is Arturo Flores. Now, to talk about, well, the the future of informality. What do you, How do you see the future of informality in this current global uncertain conditions that we have at the moment how, how is informality going to like evolve change improve what what is going to happen with informality well i think i think your questions are really uh, spot on um i have myself as a matter of fact right now started engaging with our foundation thought for action in a global campaign to create awareness of what is informality so we can have a global wave of transforming informality. The problem if we don't do that is that we're going to be inundated with it and we, we, are, we are in extinction. We're not in extinction only because of global warming um, because also global warming is one of the impacts of informality as a matter of fact. Okay. Um, Let me give you an example. If you're in a, a, in a city or a country and you say you need to boil your water for at least 20 minutes in Africa or in some parts of Latin America so that you can drink it afterwards. But how are they going to boil their water? This is well, a policy given from, you know, United Nations, World Bank. You need to boil your waters. How are you going to boil it? Bro, If you don't have electricity. Wood or You know, yeah. In the best cases, well, you will use wood. In the best cases, you will use wood, which is very, very bad for your health and your and your. They they suggest to use gas, but mm -hmm. gas is expensive yeah. and difficult yeah, yeah, to get. Yeah. yeah, so you're going to use wood. You know what people use for for food and others? They use tires. That's they tires. use waste. Yeah, of course, of course. They use tires. waste. Plastic yeah. waste. Yeah. Yeah. Plastic tires and waste, mm -hmm. and they inhale it, which is. Com you know, completely cancerogenic, and and they cook on it, and they heat themselves with it. And it goes to the atmosphere as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it's 70% of the world that operates like that. Mm. 70% of the world plus. So this is taking over the, the formals. This is taking over the smaller minority of formals. So what is going to happen if we don't do anything is that we will simply not exist. Yeah, of course. Maybe our generation is our last generation because you see the differences. You see the, the, the exponential changes that are happening in our, in our global, in our, in our earth. The immigration trade uh, traffics trafficking, the, the, the uh, global warming, the fact that we have now additional level of wars that we didn't have as much before, it's really annoying to see it. So if we sit still and we're going to be in another podcast and talk about it, that would be one thing. Informality will continue to grow. And as I said, informality is not illegality. Has not, you cannot just issue a law and the informality disappear. Informality for it to transform, and it has to transform, otherwise it's going to grow and swallow us. We need to have a global difference in the economic paradigm. The World Bank, the IMF, the UN, everybody has to think differently. The IDB, we cannot promote economic growth without pivotally establishing in the core of it the establishing of property rights. Property rights is the only way you can transform informality. And you can establish ownership of yourself, security of who you are, respect for the humankind. 
So if if we as humankinds do not respect ourselves and we do not respect our neighbors, we will not be able to have a respectful middle class, a respectful growth, a sustainable economic development. We will only have sustainable poverty, sustainable conversations about how to reduce it. I'm sorry, I'm sounding cynical, but that's what we will have. We will continue to have. Well, yeah, when... And then that's why you have these uh, two foundations, because you want to do something to solve the problem. And uh, I, I entirely agree with you that unless we change all these paradigms, then we'll keep on having nice chats or podcasts Correct. or whatever. And uh, yeah. the problem will, will still be there. Correct. So uh, tell us a bit more about the work that you are doing with your, with your foundations. You mentioned that the, the aim is to like to tell people what informality is about and show them like the way or the path but tell us a bit more about how how you work how you fund them uh, you know all these things which are relevant when when fund foundations uh work okay well uh we are now in the process of doing a full uh, awareness campaign um It starts to, uh, it, it's just starting as we speak. The foundation is um, funded from um, a regular foundational funds. You know, you, you apply for them. Um, but the intention is that it, as it grows, it gets sustained and funded from ourselves because it has to be held by us. So it has to be, if I do a good job, and our team does a good job, we should all be part of that whole process. What happens a lot of times, Arturo, is that people feel comfortable comfortable in their space. And when you tell them uh, there is hunger, there is poverty, they kind of think it's somewhere out there. And they care just a little bit before Christmas to buy a Christmas card, or they You know, they do, but, but my question to everybody is, why should we care? So what we do with our foundation is trying to explain why should we all care? And, and the response is, for everybody is very different in their emotional, it lands differently on them. But the basic principle of why should we care is because we want to let leave something to our to our children and our grandchildren. Otherwise, we will, we will be the last generation. We will fight to extinction among ourselves. We will not even wait for global warming to finish because we will have done it ourselves on our own. So that awareness is the most important part. We are organizing now uh, a media uh, coverage So we travel to several countries, countries that we worked and did the transformation and we see the before and after. You know, it's difficult because Peru no tiene más before. Eh? It's very hard to find a before there. But it's okay. We find before in Bolivia. <laughs> we find before in the neighboring countries. Okay. So, um, so we can, uh, we, we, want to, we want to show uh, witnessing the story of informality per country uh, and, and create... Um, You can call it a, a, a video process or a media process or a documentary process by which we can document exactly how is it to be trapped in this space. Um, if you like, I would be happy to share with you uh, a seven-minute uh, trailer afterwards. And uh, maybe when you wish to, uh, to upload this, you can show that as well. Sure, sure. That that would be that would be great. That would be great if you can if you can give us more information because I think it's very, very valuable the work that you do and uh, you know it, it could help a lot of people in in many countries. Like correct. Uh, so uh, I I really admire the work that you do. And uh, just to finish the this 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 first conversation, I hope we have some other conversations in the future that is not the last but um would you like to to uh tell us like an uh, an end note regarding this topic which i know i mean we can talk for hours about it but yeah we have a limited time uh 
which are some recommendations or which final ideas that you would like to, to share with us today? So uh, I want to be positive and believe that people people will engage and, and collide together to create this bottom-up transformational movement. Um, and the reason I think, and I'm positive about it, is because I noticed in Bulgaria, in the, in the Middle East, where I worked in, in Peru, if you do it very well in the very beginning and the seed is built, put in well and people recognize the, the, the importance and the impact, then they become their own drivers. So my, my recommendation is keep your politicians and policymakers, your NGOs, your advisors, keep them to their toes and ask them, don't give me, tell them, don't give me a quick and dirty solution. Push yourself to provide a reason why we are informal to transform it. Put them on the spot. Put every single responsible decision maker and advisor to decision makers on the spot. Because you know what? We all tend to be quick and dirty. You know, politics are there for four years, five years, six years, and that's it. So I, will, I would like to ask citizens to become more responsible. And I would like them to become more aware of what does informality mean. And this way, it, the, the change will be smaller. The effort to change will be smaller rather than start from zero. Okay, Elena. Well, it has been a real, real pleasure talking to you. And uh, I hope, well, the conditions of informality... Uh, will improve. Yeah. And, uh, uh, well, to our audience... Thanks for listening to us today. Uh, today we spoke with Elena Panaritis about formalizing the informal. This is Globedades, a podcast from the Faculty of uh, Global Studies at Anahuac University. My name is Arturo Flores, and I hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much. Bye. It was a pleasure. Bye.